So, who of the Dutch people here knows we from the three? The, the, ah, also the young guys. I thought only the old guys. Eh? Okay, so, we from the three is a show in Holland, which I saw when I was a kid, and like three people stand up. I'm, I'm Alex Blah. I'm Alex Blah. I'm Alex Blah. And so, this is a talk with Alex. So, and then here there are three people pretending to be Alex. And then you ask, who is the real Alex? And then they, start, they all stand up. So this is like Alex 1, that's how he called himself. This is Alex 2, it's the guy with the green hair there. And this is Alex 3. And I put them all together in one office because it was really fun. When I was annoyed, I walked in and I said, Alex! And then, oh! <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so... <laughs> So, like, uh, uh, Al talked about this software, if you want to see this in action, then you have to ask this guy. He's like at the moment one of the main guys developing that. And does it work? Uh, almost. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is Alex Kissinger, like in the next talk, we, we're going to hear about some work he did. And so this, this is work with Alex Lang, who did a summer internship with me, but he's now in Japan and couldn't afford to fly over. Um, so, so, what, so this is talk about categorical quantum mechanics, which we hear also about in the previous talk. Uh, it's an attempt to formulate quantum mechanics in terms of symmetric monoidal categories, basically using computer science methods. Uh, it's kind of an overtake of quantum foundations and quantum axiomatics, where you take interaction between systems as the primary concept, rather than, for example, measurement as, as a lot of quantum logic programs did. Uh, in the vein of logic, it's actually a new take on quantum logic, and which, which, which is genuine logic in the sense that you can automate it, like that's what the guys are doing, who are developing this quantum ethics software. Um, so it, it, it gives rise to high level methods for quantum information and quantum computation, as there are for classic computer science, so that's something people also work on. And uh, what, I, what I find particularly attractive is, is that it gives rise to an intuitive, purely gra uh, graphical quantum language you could say so that you can just reason purely diagrammatically about quantum mechanics and without actually having to know Hilbert spaces or stuff like that. Uh, so it's something which start, the main program started in 2004 you could say. So basically how do we think about a physical system there? Uh, well we label physical uh, systems just by uh, labels then we think of processes as an arrow which takes a system of, of some kind into a system of another kind. We assume we can compose systems, so if we've got two systems, we can compose them together to make one whole. And if we've got pro and the same, of course, for processing only, or processes only systems. And if we've got two processes which happen after each other, we can compose them too, of course. And that's basically the, the setting, the, the sort of the, the background setting with which you work. And the key thing is that, uh, I think as opposed to how people usually think in a, say, more mathematical approaches to quantum theory, that now the tensor is actually the key player. Like we don't really think, we don't really care about the internal structure of these labels. We care about what happens to them if we compose them. So it's, it's, it's in a way a realization of uh, Schrodinger's program when he suggested that uh, the way in which compound quantum systems compose are like, is the most important aspect of quantum mechanics. Not really measurement, but really the way they compose. And this program takes that, that stance very seriously. So we basically, I mentioned this graphical calculus, we represent things by boxes, so this would be a physical process, this would be the input system, this would be the output system, and so you can compose these boxes in the same, and this actually just means one process that happens after another one. And if you're talking about two processes that in parallel, you just put the boxes side by side. And so, you see, the, the entire structure uh, explained here is sort of can be purely captured in diagrammatic terms. Um, so there is a theorem by John and Street from 91, which has an, equ an equational statement between expressions in symmetric, diagrammatical, uh, monoidal, categorical language holds if and only if it is derived in the graphical notation via diagram equivalence. So that sort of says that with this type of Penrose diagrams, because he sort of came up with this idea, you can basically capture everything you can do with symmetric monoidal category on the nose. Uh, now we do want to do a little bit more than what you can do with any symmetric monoidal category. We want to do some quantum physics, so we have to add a little bit of structure. And one, one thing we add is what you could call a quantum metric, and that basically involves having an operation which flips your boxes upside down. 
So in, in the open space realm, this would be like the edge joint, right? So you need this kind of structure, and this will enable you to express what unitarity is, what the inner product is, and things like that. And then another thing we want to express, because like I mentioned, it's all about our quantum system composed, is that we have to, to sort of assert that they don't compose in the same way as classical systems. For a classical system, if you describe an entangled uh, uh, compound system, then it's enough to describe the components. This is not true in quantum mechanics anymore, so that's something we want to assert. And one way of asserting this is to sort of axiomatize that there exists some kind of connection between these things. Like Anne was also alluding at this, like you explicitly represent the fact that there is entanglement by a wire. It, it turns out that this is the kind of way you want to do this. Uh, why? I can give you a small intuition. So this is actually what in categorical language calls compactness from compact closed categories. So why? Well, if we really represent this triangle by a piece of wire like I suggested, and you would assume that it's sort of not really connected, then you get an equation where something totally disconnected is equal to something connected. So you see, you can just, and you see, it doesn't make sense. So that's why this sort of action is the right way to sort of capture the idea in an axiomatic manner that this is indeed a connected wire. So you want to recognize this is a connected wire. Yeah? If you make this configuration, it's something connected, the identity. So that's basically a compact closed category. Uh, so a lot of the work was uh, about this was done by Kelly and Laplace, but then uh, Peter Selinger then proved the theorem, which then involved this dagger structure too. That an equational statement between expressions in very complex symmetric monoid and categorical language holds, even though if it is derivable in the graphical notation via homotopy. So, so uh, Peter has one paper about all this stuff and uh, all kind of theorems of this kind. Uh, so basically what this tells us is like, if we have this categorical st structure of dagger, uh, dagger complex metric model, uh, categories, then whatever you can do there axiomatically is exactly what you can do with the language I just presented, and vice versa. Recently something more surprising happened, again the same guy, uh, an equation of statement within expressions in dagger complex symmetric model categorical language holds even though if it's derivable in the category of finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, linear maps, tensor product, and adjoint. Which means that for a certain fragment, uh, well, for, for a fragment of quantum mechanics expressible in this language, you can prove it in quantum theory, you can prove it, prove it diagrammatically. It's a completeness theorem, like a logical completeness theorem. The reason I give this is because I will discuss this in the context of uh, the talk I'm giving, uh, the work in this paper, uh, which is actually working towards completeness for a stabilized quantum theory. So I'm not going to explain this, but then you can start using this language to prove a bunch of protocols. We saw a, whole, uh, a, whole, a lot of them in Unstock. Um, so, so, so we have this completeness theorem. Now, of course, this language with respect to for which we have completeness here is not at all universal for, for quantum mechanics. There's only a number of things you can express in that. Uh, so, for example, you want to talk about classical data, which was asked in answer, how do you formulate classical data flow in an abstract manner? Or uh, how do you formulate that a certain observable is complementary to another observable? These are things you also want to articulate, and so therefore you need a little bit more structure. And uh, the, uh, the conceptual idea behind it is that quantum data cannot be copied nor deleted. Classical data can be copied and deleted. And we're going to treat the cannot be copied nor deleted as a non-feature. Well, the can be deleted as a feature, which is very much in the spirit of linear logic of what we heard this afternoon in the first talk about. So an observable is basically represented by a copying operation and a deleting operation. Copying one input, two outputs, deleting one input, no output. So how do we axiomatize these things? Well, we are, I'm not going to go, go too much into this. How am I doing this time? 20 left, okay, that's good. That's, that's perfect, actually. Uh, so, 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 we're going to axiomatize such a copying operation. You know we have to flip operation. So whenever you've got something in one direction, you can flip it in the other direction. So, and we're going to ask this copying operation to be a commutative commonoid. There's a very clear operational reason for that. So this is co If you want to produce three copies of something, then there are two ways to do it. 
you produce two copies and then you duplicate the first one or you produce two copies and you duplicate the second one. That should give rise to the same result because they're copies. If you want to make two copies and you swap them, yeah, you still got the same thing because they're copies. And if you copy and then delete, then the same as the identity. So these are very operational rules. Now, so this is a natural thing to ask for a copying operation. Does this on its own axiomatize what is really a copying operation in quantum mechanics? Not quite, not quite yet. <coughs> but there is a theorem about what actually does classify a copying operation in quantum mechanics of a certain basis. And these are so-called special dagger community Frobenius algebras, which in addition to these axioms here, also satisfy these two other axioms. These are actually not the only interesting community for Venus algebra as we will, are going to see in the next talk. So there are others. But these ones, they actually axiomatize orthonormal bases. So each orthonormal basis for a Hilbert space corresponds to such an algebra. So, so it, what, what is interesting about this is this language is, like I said at the beginning, only a language which involves tensors, the tensor. It doesn't involve sums, it doesn't involve vectors. So this is a way of writing down what an orthonormal basis is in the language of tensor only. So it can be incorporated in other models than the open spaces. Uh, right, so we now know what an orthonormal basis is in this language, but it's kind of a horrible set of actions if you put them all together. It's like a bit of a mess if you want to remember them all. Fortunately, life is much simpler. So, so okay, here are just three examples we will care about, X, Y, and Z basis. This thing which I write down here turns out to be exactly the same thing as, and this is the sort of thing you already, so now we're coming closer to what you saw in Anstalk. Basically, an orthonormal basis can also be axiomatized by what we call a family of spiders, which means a bunch of morphisms with, which consists of a dot with some wires, say n input wires and n output wires, one for each n and one for each m, subject to one rule, which is if two of these things meet each other, then they fuse together. So if two spiders meet each other, they fuse together. And it turns out that this, this basically on its own subsumes all of this and subsumes all of this. So we've got a very simple principle now. So, so remember, this is exactly the same as an orthonormal basis. That's the main point. So an orthonormal basis is a family of spiders, which is such that if two spiders meet each other, they fuse together. It doesn't look much. So if you ask... If you go to, if you, so let me state this now explicitly. If you ask for linear maps of which the input is the tensor product of a number of Hilbert spaces n, of which the output is the tensor product of a number of input spaces n, which satisfy these rules, then they determine uniquely an orthonormal basis. That's a statement. By putting everything together, which I said. So, so such a dot is basically a basis. And that's what, for example, in Anstalk, when you saw a red dot, was an example of these, which captures a red base. When you saw a green dot, was an example of these, which captures a green base. And, for example, the sort of yanking action, which I talked about in the beginning, is an example of this spider. <coughs> so you take a spider of this form, you see it here, you flip it upside down there, here are identities, and you see this yanking room just after which is subsumed by the spider reasoning. So we don't, so this is this kind of compact. So whenever you get such a, such a spider family, you got one of these cups too, with which you can do this yanking. Um, okay, complementarity. So this is joint work with Ross. So we want to say when two bases are, so we know now what the basis is. That's a family of spiders. So when are two bases complementary? Well, bases are complementary, and we saw this in Amstok. When you can, so this, this basically is on the nose an articulation of complementarity on biases. If you've got a spider of this color, a spider of this color, they make this configuration and then they split off. That's complementarity, this equation, on the nose. That's what complementarity. And so as you saw in uh, some of the derivations, this played an important role in, in these derivations in these protocols. Now in the paper with Ross, we also identified the stronger form of complementarity. So this is one now you saw in our talk too. Uh, it, it looks maybe not that similar to this, but you can actually show that this follows from this. And we call this a strong form of complementarity. It's all complementary observables up to dimension 4. I'll, I'll ask you this, Rast. What is Ross? Up to 4 all satisfy this. Do you have a counterexample? 4 doesn't. Uh, up to 3. Yeah, 
So, yeah, well, far. so in many cases, complementary observables have this strong law too, but there are counter examples. But it turns out that for a lot of the computations we do, it's this form of complementarity you need. So this is going to be an important uh, factor. So okay, phases. So now, whenever you got a family of spiders or an orthonormal base, for free you get actually also an abelian group of phases. This is for purely abstract reasons. If you got such a nice bright structure, you get an abelian group of phases, and you can actually then prove that you can just decorate these spiders with these phases, and then. You've got a new rule of, for decorated spiders. It means if two decorated spiders meet each other, their decorations add up. So that's how you reason about phases. Uh, for example, that's so if you've got like a Z observable, then your phases just correspond to the points on this circle. So like a spider is just like a point with a phase, could be something like that. A gate with a phase could be something like that, and then you can generalize this to things with more legs. So that's all these phase things, and then you can, so this is for the red one, and that's something uh, Robert asked earlier, universality, this calculus with spiders with phases is universal, because you can write down a local unit tree in its Euler angular composition, and as you sign on start, you can write down the C log gate, and then you know you can do everything. Not in a pretty way, but you can do it. Um, right, so we got in universal calculus. And then people have used this to do things. So Ross Dunk and Simon Perdrix did a bunch of stuff in magic measurement based quantum computing in a paper which they can't finish. Never <laughs> seem, it never seems to be finished for some reason. Uh -huh. So it was a short paper at iCalipo 10. Uh, so the I, yeah, by the way, MBQC, like Robert is one of the fathers of MBQC, and he, so is he of T MBQC, topological measurement based quantum computing. <coughs> and recently Claire Holzman used this calculus to do some stuff there, which got published in New Journal of Physics. Uh, so then there is other stuff like Han Hildebrand, there's a Chinese group who has been doing a lot of work recently, which they are about to write down, I guess. So it's where well, you can do things with this. Uh, software, we've got a software to reason about these things. Uh, again, like if you want to see this Alex Mary, the green guy in the back, you want to talk to. <laughs> The green hair guy, not the green, you're not green. <laughs> <laughs> right. Trichomaticity. So that, those were two calls. How much minutes do I have? Five, ten? Ten. Oh, ten. Perfect. Perfect timing. Trichomaticity. So this, this was about two colors. So in this paper is actually about three colors. Uh, if you take a qubit, then there are three complementary observables there. Why single out two and develop a calculus for two and not for three? Well, maybe you don't win anything by doing it for three, but well, let's try. Uh, so let's, let's recall what this red green calculus is. You've got a bunch of generators. So this basically generates all these spiders. You can sort of plug them together and meet the spiders. But let's write them just down in like the algebra form. So you've got these generators here. You've got a bunch of generators for red. And then you've got a Hallamar gate. You do need explicitly to have a Hallamar gate in your calculus. There's a bunch of rules, for example, uh, that a rule, if it's true, you can also flip it upside down and it stays true. Only topology matters. It's something which is general. And then basically, for each of the colors, you've got this decorated spider rule that if two spiders meet, then they fuse together and their decorations uh, fuse together. And now, the key about this red green color is, of course, how these different colors interact with each other. And this is, this is basically the laws to which they are subject. Uh, so the, the above bit tells you that you're dealing with a bi-algebra, so that's this strong complementarity actually, this, this is the strong complementarity, you're dealing with bi-algebra. Uh, and then you've got about two rules here, which is done about, well I write down at two, basically two means pi. So we, th we think that we, we are dealing like with a group of four, four elements, four element cyclic group, we call them one, two, three, and four the elements, four equals to zero if you want to, and so two would be pi rotation. And the pi rotation, for example, for, uh, for the red, for the red color, if you take this to be the x observable, is like the not gate. So it's like a logical negation. So these are rules for logical negation, you could say. So logical negation of one color goes through the other color, and the logical negation sort of changes the, the angle of, of the phase of the other color. Uh, you've got this, these rules which basically says that h changes color. If you push, push an h through to something, it changes color. And for example, 
This also implies that this rule is also true for the other corner because you just push, push an edge through and then you get the other rule. Mm -hmm. So it also here is a, a red, a green copy is red. If you push, push an edge through that, you can get red copies green. And so all these things also are true for the other corner. Importantly, these two cups are the same. That's a very important aspect of this calculus. So the, the cups induced in each course are the same in this calculus. It's very important. It makes things a lot. Huh? Well, this, 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 this is the same as what I wrote down before as this. Oh yeah, it's the preparation. But the, the thing is, so basically how you build it is you take, for example, this copying operation and then you stick a dot underneath. And so you just get something with two outputs. That's how you build. And that's why, in principle, different bases could lead to different curves. And it's actually a, a fact that you count that if you, so for the Z and X observables, you can set up things that are equal. You can't do this if you're dealing with three observables. You cannot have the same cup for X, Y, and Z. You can't do that. If you, so you can prove you can't do that. So that's part of the difficulty of this three color three color code. That's why we that's actually one reason we decided to stick to two cores in the beginning. Because otherwise you have to deal with different cups. Anyway, now we did this anyway. Uh, this, this calculus is by no means complete. So here is an equation which is not true. And this is something which is very useful. It actually popped up in a lot of places in Alan's thesis where sort of artificially had to throw it in. This is a rule which is very useful, not valid. Uh, some other stuff which is not valid. Not provable, not provable, not provable. Yeah. Not provable. Uh, other stuff, for example, the Euler annual decomposition of the other Margate is not provable. That's something which showed up in a paper by Simon and, and Ross, who actually proved that from the, from the Nest theorem, like for graph states, uh, is provable in this calculus, even no leaf, you throw in the Euler annual decomposition of the other Margate. So then you get something which is kind of a bit nice. It is sort, it's sort of brut brutal to sort of throw that in by hand. So they showed that it was equivalent. Um, right, okay, so we go to the three color calculus. Why? Because it elegantly incorporates this oil angle decompositions, which was a which, which proved to be essential. I showed up. It rather excellentizes pi over two rotations besides pi rotations, if you remember. So this calculus doesn't say anything about pi over two. So like this, this means pi, actually. So it says something constructive about pi, nothing about pi over two. The one will, and for example, this rule crucially involves pi over 2. The rules don't say anything about it, so why do you, would you expect that, 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 that you can say something about an equation like this? Uh, Qubit symmetry, symmetries are now entirely encoded in the algebra. Uh, it's complete for everything we know. It means we can everything prove which we have tried to prove so far. <laughs> it, that's like, so that's sort of a, I think that's like physicist completeness theory of everything. You can, you can do everything. We can, can do everything we want to do. We don't know whether we can do everything. We can do everything we know we tried. <laughs> and of course, three colors are clearly on equal footing. What, do, what sacrifices? You lose the fact that you've got a unique compact structure, so the cups are not unique anymore. Uh, and, you, and the bioalgebras will rule the line involve explicit phases. That's just two sacrifices. So, what's the change? So, this, this, these are like sort of the block spheres for the ZX calculus, which well, what is important is where you start, where you put the zero. Zero is really important where you put the zero. So you put the zero here, and then you rotate like that. Here you put the, put the zero there, and you rotate like that. So for the three core characters, we did something else. We kept this observable like it was. We changed the starting point of this one. And then we put this one. And the reason why, you can see basically here. Like, so you see, these, these, these two observables are related by the other market. It flips them. Other market flips these two, red and green. But here, here there is something else. They, are, they have some rotational symmetry. There is some operator which like rotates between them, and that's so it sort of circulates between these observables. Um, so these are the rules. You, it doesn't have much sense to throw a bunch of rules at you and then let you stare a long time. But uh, so let, let's make a comparison. So, so this was red green. So you see, that the first two rules are essentially the same. They give you a bioalgebra structure for green with respect to red, but there is a phase involved. Can't get rid of that one. Can't get rid of that one. What's three? Three, three is like a, 
in concretely you would say minus pi over 2. So 1 is pi over 2, 2 is pi, 3 is minus pi over 2, and 0 is 0. 0 is nothing. Uh, so then you, you, so, so you see here then you've got a bunch of rules involving about 2, about the pi gate. We don't need them anymore. They, they come for free. Uh, what we do have is like, we also, for example, so this is actually a rule about how red copy is green, or some aspect of red copy in green. And this turns out that so actually green also copies blue here. So that's, that's something, because you've got a third observable, you're going to say also how it copies it. And this is sort of in a way saying that green doesn't copy red. Because you see, if it goes in, you get something which is still connected. It doesn't really, so, it, so you just, it's, it's simple, you get a few rules, and then you get like, this kind of operation which is generated in this way, and this is actually the color changer now. So it rotates between the three colors. So you see, I've, I've got two directions here. This just means that this is the inverse to that. So this is the one, and so of course, you get a whole bunch of new rules by just pushing these color changers just through all of these. So you see, it's, it's not more complex in a way. It's not more complex than this. It's, and, and it gives you more. Uh, well, it, the bad thing is that these cups and caps have color now. And if you sort of put them together, you don't get identity. But you actually get your logical knot. And so your logical knot sort of pops up as this sort of combinations of cups and caps in these calculus. Uh, so we call them dualizers. So Simone, yeah, Simone and I wrote the paper about this. Uh, oh, fine, that's good. Right, so. So okay, this is the calculus, you can read about it in paper. We probably need to do more work on it to maybe even make it more elegant, I don't know. Uh, what did we prove? So the, the complete octahedral group, which, genera which generates stabilized unit trees, and that's faithfully in this calculus. So it's all there, and it's generated by these things. So, so you got a feel, so you got a feel that is very close to like stabilized quantum mechanics, and there may be we, there may be a case for completeness there. But you've got a calculus which is not just uni universal for stabilizer, but also complete, meaning <coughs> you can prove everything here that you could prove in your space. That's some vague conjecture we have. That this, because we know we can do everything we want to. If it, it's not a mathematical proof, but at least we have a claim for a conjecture. So the order angle decomposition of Adamar Geert basically holds by construction because Adamar is not a primitive. You build it, so of course. Adamar is how you build it. Um, we have commutation of the following, so red-green, some, some red-green can be mapped into RGB. I should, I, I should have actually formally said what I mean by RGB. RGB is just the category you get by taking these generators, building diagrams, and then subjecting them to rules. That's the RGB. Basically this means like, so everything is provable in RGB is also provable in RGB. So you prove more. You prove strictly more. Because, uh, because we, for example, know that we prove this. And in particular, we can prove this now too. Like the image of that through this function, we can prove. So this rule is now true. We can prove it. Uh, so basically, this is the translation of red green in this language. So basically, you just map red. That's why this tree showed up in this bio for a while. The red one becomes now the red one with a face, and the deleting one becomes also a deleting point with a face. So that's a translation. Um, ah, this is actually the characterization of this calculus. So if you add to the red green calculus this equation, which means you quotient the category by this additional equation, then they become equivalent. So on the nose, the three-color calculus is the two-color calculus plus the composition of the Hadamard gate. That's, that's the idea. Uh, so, so, so the three-color calculus is actually the, the, the calculus which, for example, uh, in which you prove Van, Van, Van der Nest's theorem about ref states. That's where you prove it. That's so canon. Here is the translation. This is how you get the blue colors then. This is how you get the blue colors. Uh, I think that's it. Oh, yeah. So, so I already mentioned, are we complete with respect to stabilized versus quantum mechanics? I put step as a category, I wrote a paper with uh, Bill Edwards and, and, and Rob where we defined stabilized formalism as a category. Uh, 
Is there a corresponding encoding of spec? Spec is a category of spec and story theory. Is there a corresponding encoding of that? So because the algebra of your circular group is actually encoded within the calculus now. It's sort of in there. And we know for a fact, in work we did, uh, oh, wait, wait. Uh, actually, I want to. We know for a fact from work we did in another paper uh, that the, the essential difference between stabilized quantum mechanics and the toy theory, which is classical from, from rock, is the, the structure of the group, of the phase groups, this group of phases. In one case, it's C4, in the other case, C2 times C2. And so here, you, it should be visible in the algebra now, because these groups are encoded in the algebra. So you should see really the difference. And then, and because here we, we sort of connect that to non-locality, maybe there's something to learn about non-locality in the three quality calculus. And uh, like, like, actually, like in, with Simone, we have a paper now, you have also, this, this, this was raised in Amstad, how you can make this classical data flow really part of the diagrams, really in terms of wires. So there's a question how you can then build a formalism with the three calls, which also nicely incorporates the classical data flow. I think this is fairly straightforward, which it should be done. Uh, that's about it, yeah. Questions? So, uh, it seems to me the red green type is, is, is conceptually uh, superior to the red green blue type in the following sense that algebraically speaking, I don't have three independent degrees of freedom. Mm. X, Y, and Z. I can always, you know, X times Y is I, Z. So just thinking of that equation, you know, the observables, the poly X times poly Y is I, Z plus Z. Why can't you just throw in a scalar? You know, your blue dot is now just a composition of green dot and red dot and a scalar, and you should be able to simulate the whole red, green, blue calculus. It, it's, it's not always the, the most economical set of things that is the most pretty one. I would say. I, I kind of see where you're coming from, and, and like, for example, red green is enough for universality because of what you say, essentially, I think. But, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily the prettiest thing. Just, just making something minimal doesn't give you always the prettiest thing. This, this calculus is almost as simple. Now, for it, I think here we, like, what would you prefer? Like, red green plus decomposition of, of, Hall, of Hallamar Gate as in its oil angles. Yeah, what a beautiful kind of thing to throw in my hand. It's, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible to throw this in my hand. Is so, it possible that you can replace that extra structure about the order and decomposition with something about the scalar? Uh, no, no, no way, no, no, because the type, the type is not the scalar. The type is not the scalar, it's like of the map. But, it, but see, I don't understand, okay, it seems to me the blue dot just is red dot followed by green dot times the scalar i. Algebraically speaking, you know, that's true of the poly matrices. So, yeah. so uh, no, but why can't so, I characterize the red dot? The poly matrix, matrix, that's provable, yeah, that's provable in ZX. Yeah. That's provable in ZX, actually, yeah. That's an equivalent statement of the biological law, it's true. Yeah, but it's true just for an angle zero, or an arbitrary angle, it's not true, I think. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's only true for like zero and pi and nice angles. Uh, I mean that if you the the blue right. our rotation with the angle alpha cannot be decomposed into uh, uh, a green and a red rotation. You can decompose it into green and red, but it will be more complicated than just yeah, as right. a green and right. red. Right. Okay. Yes, yes, that's, that's partly where it came up. So, so if, you, if you do, uh, for example, the quantum key distribution, that was actually the starting point, that was the first thing I told her about specifically. And there you have to sort of take a GHZ state and you measure it in X, uh, both, both in X, uh, Y and Z. Uh, no, Y and X. GHZ state is sort of formulated in, in Z base and then you, you, you measure it in Y and X. You get a very simple reduction. I should have put this in the start, but I, I thought I wouldn't have time. Yeah. And if you measure in the white bases, you get a high order two phase, which is not very pretty. Is if you um, if you swap from the S to the Rock, then the the phase of the gate you just get a very rare hundred and fifty phase. 
When uh, the thing is, if you start to do the reduction, then you you need this rule, which I showed, like with these ones, and then is that the one you can prove it?